For those of you who are listeners of Taco Cast's latest podcast, Among the Dirt and Trees, which, by the way, if you love true crime, be sure to check out that podcast. Brienne, the host of the show, is currently without power and buried in some snow with the winter storm. So this week's episode will be a tad delayed. Uh, there may be two episodes going out next week instead. So for everyone who is enduring uh, a lot of snow in this winter storm, please be safe, be warm, and be well. So when we first started recording this episode, we didn't realize just how long it was going to take. So it will be broken up into two parts, with the second part being released on Thursday. For those of you who are subscribed to us on Patreon and supporting us there, you'll have access to the full episode right away. And for those of you who subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll get notified when the full episode is out, and the full episode will be released before Thursday on both of those forums. Imagine the worst pain you've ever felt in your life. Maybe you broke a bone, tore, or even shattered something. The human body can withstand a tremendous amount of pain, that's for sure. But imagine experiencing the worst pain over and over and over again, with the person at your side not just enjoying it, but recording your blood-curdling screams. Today's episode, we discuss two of the most sadistic serial killers we've ever covered, using every tool in their box. Um, all right. Ready, guys? Ready. Welcome to another episode of Talk Murder to Me. hey Saturday night. Yes. We're about to change the clocks. I am really excited about this. What? Me too. Are we going backwards or forwards? Forwards. We spring, spring ahead. forward, yeah. So do I get to sleep in? Or? No. No. You lose Shit. an hour, but it will be lighter later in the evening. Mm-hmm. Also... I just think it's really unfortunate about the fact that we're losing an hour of sleep when I'm I'm like 99% sure that we're going to get real fucked up on these drinks tonight. So the hint tonight, we finally got a hint again, woohoo, uh, was Toolbox. Mm-hmm. And that is the same name of the cocktail, correct, Nicole? It is. So this drink is pretty much straight liquor and all the orange juice that I could fit in the glass afterward. You know, I would actually think it would taste more boozy. So I'm like, actually even, I'm worried. Yes. So this is... It's good. It's not terrible, but it's going to have some mal effects, I believe. It is <laughs> gin. The amount of different liquors on this table is scary. It's like a Long Island iced tea without like it tasting like iced tea. It's like an orange crush. Yeah. It is gin, vodka, white rum, and tequila, along with orange juice. I feel like do we have grenadine? I feel like we should put some grenadine in there, but Yeah, we do have grenadine. Maybe we should we could do that. Um what are your thoughts, John? Well, I don't know what grenadine is. It it's like cherry. Well didn't we didn't we, It's it, pomegranate. It, yeah, sure. I feel like that's wrong. I mean it's not terrible. It's not great, but Well, it's the it'll recipe. Like, it'll, okay. It'll taste like a tequila sunrise if we put grenadine in there. We can yeah. we can get through one and then maybe we'll switch it up. Um but Oh, yeah. you you think we're gonna have two of these? Oh, my God. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We shall see. This is episode 222. Ooh. Cray, cray. I can't wait until 666. It's going to be great. It's going to be like 10 years from now. (laughs) (laughs) We're not even going to be on the air. We're going to be fucking rich. (laughs) Sell out. I I hope. (laughs) I don't know. Sign that Spotify deal, and then I'll be like, peace. I'm that, out. It requires you to continue oh, podcasting. <laughs> I don't think you understand how Joe Rogan's Spotify deal works, but okay. Yeah. Uh, so before we get started, though, we got a few uh, Patreon subscribers to welcome this week. We had like just just so many uh, folks that have joined, and it's it's fun. Um, we're getting some great questions for our weekly Ask Us Anything that are super thoughtful. So this week we've got uh, Elizabeth, Amanda, and Rachel. Uh, and James, who have joined. So thanks, everyone, for joining. Woohoo! Thanks, Woo. guys. And uh, as part of our uh, Supreme, Supremo tier, there is an opportunity for you to dictate what surprise shot we take, and we will dedicate it to you. So um, we're actually going to do two uh, this evening. We oh, didn't, really? Well, we didn't have the ingredients last week. So, so. we're going to make up for it because she did give us two options for us. And they both actually sounded really good. So I was like, well, shit, if we're here on a Saturday night, we're Jen's sleeping over. She's not driving. 
That's perfect because the episode is two two two. We're actually covering two killers tonight. Whoa! Oh. Which was completely by happenstance. But if we do two shots and have two drinks each, and I just had two beers, Lish is two it all the way. I had two truly lemonades earlier. Oh my god! I'm still on my beer. We're gonna thing. we're. This is going to be an interesting night. At least we ate a hearty meal beforehand. Yeah. All right. I'm going to actually have us t- do the shot first, and then I'm going to read the description. Okay. Do I get to sing the surprise shot song twice? Of course. <laughs> but of course. We're going to and- be we're going to be literally seeing doubles too. <laughs> <laughs> as long as, as long as I can sleep for the one less hour. I mean, I did take a nap today. Two less hours. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> so this so this shot, I don't know if I said it, this is dedicated to Kristen. Hey, Kristen. One of our loyal Supremos and star of Orange oh, yeah. is the New Black. Surprise shots, surprise shots. We don't know what they are because they're a surprise. Also, I was just, I don't like the way I played my bongos on that because I was thinking well, about it too much. Good thing is you get another chance after, after we do there. Yeah, okay. Our second. What the fuck was that? That tasted like Robitussin. That was interesting. Uh, Kristen is also a bartender, and she said she had someone ask for her for an Incredible Hulk, Ugh. which is what we just had. Hulk smash. Um, she said, I told him I didn't know what it was, but she'd be happy to make it if he could tell her what was in it. It was Hennessy and Hypnotic. I'm sh- he's like, I'm sure you'd... I'm sorry, you'd like me to do what with your cognac, sir? Trust me, it's delicious, he assured me. Sure enough, it was surprisingly delicious, and it was incredible Hulk green. It was a one-to-one mix. Any cognac will do, but hypnotic would be tri- would be tricky to substitute. I actually kind of liked it. I don't. We don't drink Hennessy down here in South Carolina. Well, I'll tell you that right now. That's a northern drink up there trying to stay warm drinking on Hennessy. We don't drink that down here. Well, we drink moonshine. We drink wild turkey. That's, that's true. We do get some moonshine. I need to get my whistle going in, though. <laughs> Um, so, so that was shot number one for Kristen. All right, you guys. So while Nicole was getting the next shot, I wanted to say we had a supporter of ours tell us about another podcast that is sort of similar to ours. And I actually looked them up and listened to a few of their episodes and is extremely good. It's a, a, uh, so I reached out to them. The podcast is called I Said God Damn. God Damn. Which is from Pulp Fiction on Uma Thurman. I said, God damn. It's a true crime podcast from Stacy and Aaron. And I reached out to them and I was like, hey, you know, I really like your podcast. They actually produce it themselves and it sounds extremely professional. And it's almost like if you were to take me out and just have Nicole and Jen kind of uh, dynamic, dynamic going on. But you can tell that they're best friends, and I liked what I heard. So yeah, it was good. Yeah, definitely go subscribe to that. I said, God damn. I'm glad we're doing these shots tonight because this story is fucked. <laughs> Holy shit. This story is fucked. I gave you the hint, toolbox. How good could this story be? <laughs> I mean, this is, what the fuck? It's a toolbox. <laughs> there ain't nothing good about this story. I think we are all going to really love it, That's to it. be honest with you. I'm not being sarcastic. Kristen was picking out her favorites. It's not going to go well with what we're drinking. This is like Bailey's or some shit. And I'm telling you, it's not going to go well with all this hard Can liquor we're drinking. Can I guess what it is? Is it like a pistachio shot? You'll see. I think that's it's like a, yes. a dead turtle shot. Oh my god, stop! That's terrible. <laughs> Where do you come up with I this like stuff? <laughs> I, I like turtles. I like turtles. Surprise shot! Surprise shot! We don't know what they are because they're a surprise. You can see my face like what? as soon as you say it. I know. I'm like, <gasps> it's fucking Bailey's. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, I like that a lot. I loved it, but it is not going to go well with this shit. I could drink a whole thing of that. We're going to be puking. Is this a, was it a pistachio shot? It was. Um, I don't know what the name of it, but yes, it tastes just like pistachio ice cream. One part Irish cream, one part amaretto, and one part blue curacao. This is the only time I have ever enjoyed anything with blue curacao. I in know. It. She said, again, I initially thought, are you sure about this? The curacao just threw me off because I'd only ever used it for color. But I tried it and it was great. He is asked this me, the same guy? 
No, different different customer. Oh. Just like pistachio ice cream, right? Indeed. Yum. That was fantastic. I liked the first one. I know you guys weren't a huge fan, but I like that one too. But eh. I love pistachio ice cream mm. um, and pistachio flavor. So, yeah, that was we a winner. We have to go to Teats after. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. So, um, tonight, the hint is toolbox. So, Nicole, where are we going and who are we brutally, brutally, brutally killing tonight? <laughs> oh shit. Um I think we're going to upstate New York and I think this is a like a handyman special type killer. Uh mm. I know we actually did a handyman killer once before, so at first when you told me the When we up, first hired Vinny. Yeah, I was wondering like, shoot, did he um do you ever get afraid that you pick a story that we've already done after 222 episodes? Yeah. <laughs> So at first I was like, oh, I do that I sometimes. Do a handyman killer. Yeah, with Joel Rifkin and well, not Joel Rifkin. That was yeah, William, Joel Rifkin like, was William, handyman. William Patrick Fife, yeah. I remember. Yeah, how'd you know that? Because I uplo- re-uploaded all of the <laughs> things <laughs> twice to Patreon ad free, and yeah. so I remember all of our series. I got a nice refresher. Yeah. Um. So I think this is a handyman type killer uh and we're going to upstate new york in like i'm gonna say this is like a 2002 era Hmm, okay i think that we're going to the 70s and i think we're gonna go to california buka de bipo buka de bipo (laughs) um i just uh, and well john mentioned that it was we're talking about two different killers tonight so i think that we are going to be talking about um a team of people who are uh, of two people that are in on a plot to murder people, and they have um, different arsenals that they use. Hmm. All right, so tonight we are going to California again. Whoa! Oh my god! Oh my god! I'm never right about this, and I didn't even second guess myself. Is that what you guess? I'm proud of you. <laughs> So if you're new here, this is your first time. Welcome to this Talk Murder Me. I put all my sources and photos and videos on talkmurder.com. Just go there. It, on the homepage, you will see episode 222. 222. And this is episode 222, so go ahead and click that post. Alternatively, we are streaming this on YouTube. That's Y-O-T-U-B-E.com. Just type in Talk Murder to Me. And this is, of course, episode 222. 222. And this tonight is the Toolbox Killers a duo. So this, who you're looking at now, is Shirley Lynette Ledford. How old is Shirley, do you think? 27. I was going to say between the ages of 28 oh and 34. God. You guys are freaking bad. Why? <laughs> She's 18. Oh. oh well. I guess it's kind of a older picture. I well, think they, I mean, you have to think about the different hairstyles and eras and things like that. We can't necessarily. Yeah. So uh, Shirley Lynette Ledford is who we're starting with tonight. She is a brunette, uh, pretty, pretty blue eyes. Piercing. And piercing. Piercing oh, blue eyes. Piercing blue eyes. Yeah. Piercing blue eyes. She's got lipstick on, very confident looking, um, extremely pretty. I know I shouldn't say that. I saw somewhere where someone had requested for male true crime podcasters to stop and and newsmen in general to stop referring because you see all these newspapers and they always describe the woman as oh they're beautiful yada 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 and i i mean i just think we're embedded to do that Mm. but i mean she is very beautiful. Sorry, I don't know what else to say, but she's brunette. Well, we usually comment. Nicole and I will say something about the handsome yeah, the yeah. Men, men. I just think that's a human thing. Right? Yeah, I I, attractiveness. I, I get it. I understand why it may be offensive because if she is the victim, then it's like that's yeah. not all that is yeah. about her. But at the same time, I mean, it's also... I don't know. Well, it's not like... I, I, mean, I don't know. No, I mean, it's true because on these stories, I mean, this happened... We're going to... Uh, October 31st, Halloween night, 1979. So, um, to, I got two things right. What'd you say? 70s. To research a victim from the 70s. I mean, think about it. Even today, you won't be able to find much on, on my on background. Life, yeah. yeah. You know, and try to go and find a victim's background, an 18-year-old from the 70s. I mean, that, there's hardly nothing there. But 
what the family has written in you know the obituaries. In fact, uh, this lady Shirley Lynette Ledford, her uh, uncle, I believe, I, I don't know who it was, but someone had wrote recently on her find a grave site this long thing about how you know she's up in heaven and it was just a long thing and it was one of the ledford families so i can link to that anyway we're going to october 31st 1979 this is 18 year old shirley lynette ledford she is standing outside of a gas station she's actually on her way home from work she worked that night and she's walking back home everyone is hitchhiking around this time especially in california the victims in this story are hitchhikers, and back then, not everyone had their own automobile, unless you're a killer. So you would hitchhike, and young girls would hitchhike. I mean, 12, 13-year-old girls would hitchhike. I was watching something, and someone, there was a younger person, they said to like their uncle or something, or older someone, they are like, aren't you going to give me a ride? And they were like, you have a thumb, don't you? Like... Jeez. Uh, well, we used to walk all the all around where I lived when I was like six and seven, you know. But then again, I was like on steroids and all buff and shit when I was six. So I mean, I used to walk. No to, one's gonna fuck with me. I used to walk to, <laughs> when I was in when I was in like later grades of elementary school and um, like middle school. I would walk to school by you know with you know I'd walk by myself from. Like my house to my friend's house, and then we'd both walk to the school. Mm-hmm. But I mean, never hitchhike. There was a there was a man who used to hitchhike a lot where I was from. He well, he was in a tragic accident, and he was like impaired ever since the accident, and so he would hitchhike. And, and like, he, poor guy, like he he got really messed up in that accident. But he, you would see him hitchhiking all over New Bedford. And hmm. I think he died a few years ago, actually. But like, you just—I don't even remember what his name is. But like, you knew, like, like he was like a staple of New Bedford, and people would give him rides. I think. I, I, well, I—I I don't know. I never gave him a ride. <laughs> and like, we never... New Bedford, they would run him off the road and throw beer cans at him, probably. No, <laughs> not the North End. So Shirley is outside of a gas station. She has her thumb up, and she is walking home. This is Halloween night. It's late at night in the evening time, 8, 9 p.m. She's walking home from work, and a van pulls up, this van, and go to talkmer.com to see these photos here. Oh, looks like the van we took our pictures in. It does. Yeah, this is a 1977 GMC van. This isn't the actual van. This is a, uh, I mean, this is the exact, exact model, but this right here is, is the exact van that pulled oh, up. Oh, no. Okay. So what you're looking at now is you'll see the GMC van. It has a sliding door, very old school looking, has a tire on the back. It almost looks like our logo. Uh, tinted yeah. windows in the back, and we're looking inside the cargo area, and can you kind of describe what you're seeing? There's no seats there. It's a mess. It almost looks like the, like, the same setup as the RV that we drove almost. Like, it's just a little bit smaller than the RV, the RV we drove. Yeah, so inside the cargo section, complete mess. I, it's hard There's to... There's, like, plywood. Yeah, looks it's, like, like boards maybe, yeah. and... Everything and torn apart. Everything torn apart. There's no back seats. And the the side windows are actually closed up because... They they didn't want anyone to see inside of it. So they actually chose this van for a reason. So when Shirley is walking home, the van pulls up and there's actually two men inside of this van. And I'm going to get into their backgrounds in a little bit. One of them is Lawrence Bittaker and the other one is Roy Norris. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to get all into them here in a little bit. But... They asked Shirley if she needed a ride. She gets into the van and they actually ask her if she wants to smoke any marijuana, stuff like that. But she declined immediately after that. And this story gets right into it. Bittaker is in the back of the van. His compadre, Norris, which I'm Mm -hmm. going to show you in a minute, is driving the van up front. So he continues driving and Bittaker is in the back with Shirley. He pulls out some duct tape and he tries to wrap it around 
her mouth and she is struggling. Uh, she is struggling. Ah, he's screaming. Uh, Norris turns the radio up so no one will hear it on the street because there is kind of a lot of traffic around. So he turns the radio up. She is screaming for her life. He is, you know, stretching out the duct tape, mm -hmm. wrapping it around her mouth so she can't scream. So she started to scream and bit her, which I'll just say from now on, uh, the man in the back. Mm -hmm. So the man in the back, it actually enjoys her screaming. So okay. she's screaming pretty loud. He's actually enjoying it and kind of getting off with it. He pulls his pants down. He tries to force her to fillet him. And she is screaming, screaming, screaming. She actually stops screaming because she realizes that this is making him turned on even more. So then he says, quote, what's the matter? Don't you like to scream? End quote. Now, at this point, he takes a tape recorder and turns on the tape recorder and starts recording everything from here on out, which we're actually going to listen to. So don't worry. Oh, God. Oh, no, no. That took me a while to, to comprehend. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. So he's stripping her clothes off. He takes his fist. Now, remember, the man in the front, Roy, no Roy Norris, is still driving. So this is all taking place while the car is in motion. That's the, the beauty of having two people doing this. You know, they can do this on the on the road. So on the move, on, on the move. So Lawrence Bittaker, the one in back, starts stripping her down, starts to punch with his fist her breast, like just punch it right in the, the nipples as hard as he Punching. can. Punching. Okay. Punching, yeah. That's interesting. So at this point, Norris switches places with Bittaker. Now, I want you guys to know that Roy Norris is the deviant, the sexual deviant, and he's going to do the the brutal sexual, um, you know, uh torture methods that he has in his fucked up mind he then takes out a sledgehammer no no uh, like a uh in and what i found out it's not a huge big sledgehammer like a mini like a mallet it is bigger than a hammer but sort of mini enough to fit into a toolbox okay because he, he takes it out of this toolbox and he starts hitting her elbow with it oh he actually hits her elbow over 30 times it actually shatters and breaks Holy. and she's screaming and then he just keeps doing it i know this story got right in there didn't it <laughs> Shit. all right so before i continue i want to show you these men so on the left right there and i'll put this photo on talkmer.com is lawrence bittaker he has a tony wonder mus mustache <laughs> i don't know who that is from Arrested Development. And the person on the right there is Roy Norris. So describing hmm. Lawrence Bittaker, a uh, hippie looking, long hair. He's got a kind of a Charles Manson vibe going on, I feel. Mm. Like very mm, Interesting, yeah. Distant. He does kind of have crazy eyes. Crazy not, eyes, Not yeah. like Charles Manson's, but like you, you, you almost can't see anything in them. They're yeah. like, they follow you. Look at those. Yeah, and then Roy, Roy Norris on the right there. He kind of reminds me of a computer technician or something. He's got mm. uh, big um, BCGs. You know what those are? Big something glasses? No, I, in the army they the you know in the basic training they give you the big brown glasses. They're oh. called BCGs for birth control glasses. Oh, birth oh. control glasses. <laughs> I like them. Yeah, I like them. They're kind of back in style know. now. Oh, yeah. He's got a uh, Roy Nor Norris has got a porn stash. He looks like he's got a receding hairline. In a uh, widow's creek. In a what? widow's, widow's peak. peak. Widow's peak. Yeah, what? widow's peak. Yeah. <laughs> he he widow's almost creek. <laughs> Murphy has one of those. And if you're a uh, true crime a uh, aficionado, he kind of looks like um, Richard Cottingham at a young. Oh yeah, I can see uh, that young image there. I was gonna say these guys kind of look familiar. His photo kind of looks more old timey, which reminds me they have this app now that they can make they can animate old pictures which is really creepy i saw that while i was in the waiting room to get my blood drawn this week that <laughs> it was is weird. weird um but he it almost looks like a headshot actually well it's a mugshot yeah but no <laughs> no, but no like, not a mugshot it, it looks like a it headshot. looks like a headshot like, like a professional an actor picture. headshot yeah hey, i guess like he wanted that picture to get yeah, taken. yeah yeah 
Which, depending on who you are, I mean, you maybe want to get caught and to get a mud shot taken. I don't know. <sighs> it's a very twisted way to want to get your picture taken, but hey, they have the best lighting. All right, so Bitaker, the one on the left there, is in the back with Shirley. He's the one doing the his thing, the rape and all his stuff first. So these guys, they take turns. They actually went into this venture together to find young girls, bring them in this rape van, and rape them separately. It, like, honest to I mean, God, I know it's the 70s in California and hitchhiking and, and like, it's like a, easy like, target you hear this, thing. you hear this story over and over again, not this specific case, but like, that's just a thing that was happening back then. But like, what, what consumes people to be like, hey man, hey, what's up? Oh, not much. Oh, you want to go grab some girls off the street and rape them together while we drive around in our creepy van? Well, actually, do you want to go buy a creepy van and then go, because <laughs> they bought the creepy van. And for this sole for purpose. this sole purpose even better the the, like, uh, the van's actually called the this is a name they gave it the murder mac m a c k oh that's the name God. of the van that's what they call it the murder Real mac nice. whoa like what the fuck is wrong with people i mean i i understand we do a true crime podcast i can't be that surprised anymore but at the same time what goes through these people's heads like what is the conversation i wish i had a dialogue of the conversation like, how did this come up? Yeah. yeah. How did they strike this deal? You, I'm not expecting you to know, but I, I like, it's no, just I know. Puzzling. I'm going to tell you in a little bit. Oh, okay. He is, as I said, beating her breast with his fist. He then reaches into his toolbox. He pulls out a set of pliers. Oh, Like, no. you know, the monkey wrench pliers. Oh, Not boy. like the, um. Not needle Not nose. needle nose, no. Like but the, the, the big old monkey wrench. Yeah. The mm. ones we got in there. The, the one that yeah. you the blue used handles. to scare the rat yeah. Yeah. today. Uh -huh. Big old monkey wrench. The one that you twist the dial to tighten? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. He I pulls... know my tools. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, I do. I've been called a tool. <laughs> Doesn't shock me. By us? Bitch. Sometimes. <laughs> 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 Tell me how you really feel, John. <laughs> um, you guys got to catch up on this drink. Dude, what the fuck? Oh. You're just seeing dose. You got to catch up. All right, so going back inside, the he gets the toolbox, opens the toolbox, and grabs the monkey wrench pliers. He pulls out the pliers, and then he inserts said pliers into Shirley's vagina. <gasps> Oh, and no. he basically starts clamping and pulling. Oh, God. Oh, my so God. So anything around that area, the labia, oh. um, the, you know, the clitoris, whatever, he is just. Uh, but he's inside. He's grabbing her inside. Inside, yes, and outside. It, almost like a maniac. Uh, just in, he's just in, going in. for whatever he yeah, can get. And he's pulling it as hard as he can in, until it basically snaps off. That. All right, if you want to read this, Nicole, this is from uh, The People versus Bitteker, 1989. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, but... 1989? The, so yeah, they weren't caught for 10 years? You no, said no, this no. was in they, 79, they, right? The, this is... That's a really good point. Yeah, they, they actually were caught right after this. But Bitteker, which I'll talk about in a little bit, was a nuisance for the legal system. And you know how inmates could file different... You know things, He's like uh, suing, appeals. Yeah, so uh, this is actually an appeal. Oh, well, this is Bitaker versus the people, not the people versus. No, this Bitaker. is people versus Bitaker. This oh, is oh. his one of his appeals, one of many. This is he actually filed over forty appeals with the stupidest stuff, and, and I'll get to that here in a little bit. But this is from that. If you want to read this, Nicole. Norris compelled Ledford to orally copulate him, then turned on the recorder and began hitting her on the elbow with a hammer. Defendant told Douglas that he tortured Ledford by pulling her genitals and breasts with a vice grip. I would like to play some of the audio tape from the event that was recorded. But first, I'm going to show you a little video because I want you to see that the people in the courtroom were actually running out of running out of the courtroom and vomiting during the audio clip. So I want to show- And you're going to make us listen to this audio clip? That Yeah, that's correct. Well, so <laughs> I kind of wish I didn't chug that drink, but- <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Say it Was played in court. People rushed outside and vomited. 
so you see him rushing out and vomiting. They touched Miss. So that is at the court when they were actually playing the audio tape, and it's not the entire audio tape, but it's a a section I could find about a minute and fifty seconds of it. So that's what we're going to listen to. You know what, Nicole? If we can get through one lunatic, one ice pick, we can get through this. I actually have the full transcript of what went down. So we'll be reading that too. <laughs> Shit, you guys fucking hate me. <laughs> Shit. All right, so let's get this audio tape out the way. So this is inside the van. You get to hear the scream. You hear that screaming? Yeah. Oh my God. That sounds like a horror movie. It's not very good. Because this is the recording in the courtroom. <laughs> oh my god. It's very upsetting. Yeah. yeah. So what you're hearing now is inside the courtroom, they're recording them listen, hearing the recording of the torture. Oh my God. So anyway, that was just the screaming of the audio tape. I couldn't, I, I don't think the, the whole thing is out, but what you heard is inside the courtroom of the jury actually hearing that audio tape. And then you saw the video guys where there were people just, you know, cause anyone can join the courtroom right. with their space mm-hmm. of people running out and not only running, running out, but vomiting so well i mean you have to think about it this is this is during a time where number one true crime wasn't like a thing that people were like going out and accessing on their own number two like nothing not that nothing that they asked for and uh number three they're not people that have been like desensitized as as we are so you know the fact that they're going out and and vomiting good for them for getting out of there i mean like that was disturbing to me oh but the jury has to stay well, the jury think about has that. to stay. So if you, I mean, think about these, these jury members. If if you get a case like this and have to, you have to see all these dissection photos and all this shit. I mean, your your whole life after that is fucked. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just a random selection of your peer group, and they have to see like all this because they actually saw the evidence photos. So you know they got PTSD just from looking at it. You know, pretty crazy. But yeah, if you're Lucky enough not to be a juror, you can run out and vomit. That's true. That's a good <laughs> but if point. you're a jury, you got to hear it because that's the law. That's yeah. the law. And we obey the law. Take a bubble bath. All right. So this is actually the transcript of what is on the audio tape. I'll play Norris and you can play Letford, Jen, and Nicole can. Do the narration there. Yeah, m- make noise there, girl. Go ahead and scream. Or I'll make you scream. I'll scream if you stop hitting me. <laughs> oh, yeah? Ah! Keep it up, girl. Ah! More. Ah! Till I say stop. Ah! Unintelligible sounds are heard interspersed with sounds of Shirley Ledford crying and moaning. Sounds of Norris extracting the sledgehammer from the toolbox can be heard as Shirley, seeing him do this, again begins crying and shouts, Oh, and shouts, Oh, no, no, oh! She then screams in fear and again shouts, Oh, no, no! Before screaming again, Norris strikes Shirley on the elbow. Now, here's the thing about the audio tape. So you heard the screaming, but this is stuff you can't really hear that's what we're narrating now. So at this point in the transcript, Roy Norris, he pulls out that sledgehammer and he just starts hitting her elbow. Like of all places, he's hitting her elbow and her elbow shatters and she screams and she says that you broke it. It's broken. So her arm is flapping around. It's literally broken. She says that you're, you broke Ugh. my arm and you know what he does? He continues to hit that same spot about 25 to 30 times after it was broken. Oh, my 
my God. I cannot even imagine the pain. Mm -mm. Remember at the beginning, well, remember in September-ish when I got my patio set and I hit my elbow? Yeah. My gosh, that hurt for like two weeks. That shit hurts, man. It does. It hurt for like two weeks. I hit it so hard on that table. So I can't even- Right. Like getting hit with a sledgehammer there? Mm -mm, No, thank you. I'm all set. Like- the the mindset of this guy, this the hitting in the same spot is broken already. Like, what are you gonna do? Like, make also, it powder. Also, the internal thing. Like, if you've ever had things happen up there, like when you go to the OBGYN, like an IUD, like an IUD or, spe- or an IUD. Do they have those by then? No, yeah, they did. Oh, no, did what they? I'm saying is, like, oh. what like, I'm saying is, hurt, like, just in general, like, oh, just that, that shit yeah. hurts. Getting a pap smear is not even is not fun. You know a what I mean? What a pap, pap smear? It's gross. Whatever that is, it sounds disgusting. It's an annual it checkup. Is something that. Well, you I have don't to do, do anal checkups, Jen. <laughs> you got to get your prostate checked. <laughs> we already know that story. <laughs> Someone in in our ask us anything, please ask John about the story of his prostate exam because yeah. it is probably the funniest story I've ever heard in my life. You know, I need to find an OBGYN. A- I've never had a pap smear done. Hoobie can win Kenobi. <laughs> this bike is going can downhill. I just, oh my gosh, wait. Before we move on, I just want to, um, and John, if you move this to the beginning or whatever, it's fine. But I'll today, move it to the back. Yeah, today, a year ago today was our um, our show in... Um, West Virginia. New, it was North Carolina. It wasn't Charlotte. It was... Raleigh. Raleigh. That was a great Raleigh. Show. And that was... The, it was right before COVID hit. It was right Like, before. literally right before. Yeah, because I made that joke, I remember. It was Friday, got yeah, Friday the 13th. We we were in Raleigh a year ago today. We got fucking hamsed. Yeah, I had to drive home that time. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> I was hamsed. Where did we, where did we, we ate somewhere after. We always eat somewhere after. Oh, we got burgers. At they had a food truck. We got we got food at the yeah, food truck. Yeah, but we went with Jess and Blake. Y'all. You broke it. I barely hit it. <laughs> Do it me again. Norris can be heard lifting the sledgehammer from either the floor of the van or possibly the wooden frame of the bed the two had constructed near the rear of the van. No, 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 no. Bludgeoning sounds can be heard interspersed with repeated high pitched screams. <laughs> That sounded like the screams off the tape. I, you know, I have to, I do a lot of uh, voice acting. Shirley is struck 25 times in succession on her left elbow oh by God. Norris, who repeatedly fractures her left elbow. Each time the hammer strikes her, a piercing scream can be heard. At one point, she may have tried to say something, but her voice had become an unintelligible mass of pain. <laughs> How's that? What's going on? Oh, sorry. And, and then Bittaker says, hey, what's going on? Then Nora says, I was beating on her elbows with a hammer. Ah. Ah. <laughs> ow! What, what are you sniveling about? No. Ow. 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 That hurts my ears. I'm sorry. Dude. I'm trying to be accurate. At this point, Norris turns off the tape recorder and now it's time to end her life. She actually screams out, quote, do it. Just kill me. Yeah, no shit. Quote, I would say it too. Which is honestly. crazy. I mean, if you're getting tortured, that I mean, you heard the screams, just, I mean, harrowing screams. I mean, you can't even, I mean, you watch any horror movie, it doesn't sound like that. Put me out of my misery. Those I are would, just uh... so just blood curling, just make you cringe screams that you heard. So she says, quote, do it, just kill me, end quote. Like, just fucking do it, please, goddamn. So if you want to read this, this is from the the Bitteker versus, uh, People versus Bitteker. The tape recorder is then switched off before Nora strangles Shirley by twisting a wire coat <gasps> hanger around her neck. The last words Shirley Lynette Ledford spoke at the end of her short life were, do it, just kill me. Oh my gosh, like, I a wire coat hanger, a wire coat hanger like that takes more. Uh, I I don't have any words. Shirley Ledford was actually the last murder 
they've done together. They've killed five <sighs> girls, teenage including girls. Including her. Including her. Now, did they have any separate from each other that we know oh, of? Oh, interesting question. So they're, uh, no. they're all as no, team. No, they're all as a team. Okay. But for this murder, they thought it would be a good time if they just throw the body Black Dahlia style into a residential neighborhood mm. and just leave it there. This person. So, so that's how this they This person, caught. yeah. So they, they actually threw Shirley's, it's very degrading, but they threw her body, mutilated body, on someone's front lawn. Oh my God. And it was found actually by a, a morning jogger. Like, how can you have so much disrespect for a human life by just throwing them out like they're garbage? Like, I just don't understand. I, well, I, they did it as a, for them, it was a an act of just, uh, just um, like you're nothing type of, you know. Exactly. Like, it's. Like, like they did it as kind of a joke, honestly. Mm. Now, from the appeal, quote, they put Ledford's body in a bed of ivy in a suburban neighborhood where it was discovered by an early morning jogger, end quote. The coat hanger was obviously still wrapped around her neck. Oh, no. Because it's a wire coat hanger. They basically, you know, untwist the the little hook on it. You untwist it. I mean, you, you've done that before. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's interesting that they untwisted it instead of just stretching out the wire hanger and then pulling Oh, that's it. a good point. Maybe they did. I don't know. They, the evidence photos are not available at all. So I'm just trying to figure You're out how they You're using your own imagination? It. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they may have just pulled the, the uh, butt end of it and put Made it over it her butt, head. Like a diamond. Yeah. And then, I don't know. It's hard to imagine. like that, that. But that's not something that's like an easy... I mean, wire hangers are malleable, but still you have to like... Yeah, like, I yeah, guess they conform it to your neck yeah. too. Like, I don't know. See, I was thinking they may have cut it. Now, th- this this information is not available that I could find. At least I was thinking they may may have cut the wire hanger or something. But I no mean, who more knows? wire hangers. Yeah. Name anyway, if you want to read this, this is from the appeal. Rosemary's Baby, Nicole. Oh, that's okay. I did see that movie. I have not. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> Wait, you know the quote? Yeah, of but... course, everyone knows the quote. What from Rosemary's Baby? Yeah, no I... more wire hangers. No, nobody knows that. That's a great movie, by the way. You Very scary. Did you know that quote? No. I mean, no. I, w- I will. Are you if sure I... it's Rosemary's Baby? I'm like pretty damn sure. The what, mom what, says what, it. What is about the wire singers? Maybe it's not Rosemary's Baby. I don't now think it's I'm... Rosemary's Baby. No more wires. Hang- no more wire hangers. <sighs> you know what Rosemary's Baby's about, right? Yeah, it's about a demon baby. Like the devil, like actually impregnates this woman in a ritual. It was like an orgy. Yeah, like I actually impregnate this woman and then my spawn comes out. Well, where's what's that quote from then? <laughs> Mommy Dearest. Is Fuck, it Mommy Dearest? Know. God damn it. Read this, I Nicole. I don't know. Just read this question, at statement. Shirley Ledford's body was discovered shortly after she was killed. The coat hanger was still wrapped around her neck. The body had extensive bruising and tearing on and tearing on her breasts, bruises on the genitals and bruises on one elbow. Laboratory examination showed sperm in her mouth, vagina, and anus. Maybe so, it was Mommy Dearest. She was she was raped by both, actually. By both men raped. So, question so far. Just, uh, <sighs> uh, so the other the other victims, you said there were five victims total, were they all killed in the same manner? Sort of. So there is obviously an escalation pattern, like most serial killers. It takes them a while to figure it out, and then they get more gruesome. This was the last murder. And most gruesome? And most gruesome, okay. yeah. Okay. But they're still all pretty bad, which we will explore in pretty in-depth detail. So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what? Do I have my drunk face on? No. Very, very frowny. Like, oh. All right. This is a sad story. It's awful. So, so who you're looking at now is young Lawrence Sigmund Bitteker with his hands in his pocket. I got one hand <laughs> in my pocket and the other one's painting the piano. So, I kind of wonder what his hand's doing because it looks like it's 
playing with his balls. <laughs> Look how far it is down. <laughs> I mean, dude, you're taking a photo. But anyway, he's well, a that, child. The photo you're looking at is of Lawrence Bittaker. This is in his foster home. He was a foster kid. Both of them were actually, but interesting. It's uh, this is the first that is interesting picture of him, and you see him. He looks kind of confident. Uh, uh, Brown, two other younger girls there. He's got his left hand shoved deep inside his pocket. Not just, I mean, it almost looks like he's kind of doing something down there. But I, you know, how was he know. treated by his foster family? You guys, you know, I think I might become a foster parent not soon. But like, if I don't have my own kids, I think I'm going to foster kids. Just go. There you go. You, you need to talk to one of them scientists about making you a, a genetic one of those. I don't want to do that. Petri dish babies. No, I don't want to do that. I, there are plenty of kids that don't need home. That I mean, <laughs> <laughs> because they live on the streets. <laughs> there are plenty of kids that need homes. Like I don't need to make my own out of a petri dish. I don't like that. I like that idea, Jen. It's yeah, I, idea. I like the petri dish idea. Oh, the no, other. No, <laughs> the foster idea. It's kind of like us when we want we want to rescue all the dogs. Yeah, you probably could find one of my kids out there uh, they're so them. like they're actually like <laughs> they're, just there don't have tell been them several that. students that have like come like that have like that i've had over the past couple of years that i'm just like oh my gosh you just need the right environment and i just want to like take care of them so if i if i've always said this actually i, I just haven't told you guys like if i don't get married like by the time I'm like 40 45 like and i'm i'm okay with how i'm living like i do want to um That's foster, awesome. foster i love that yeah. and like seven cats yeah i get it all right so who you're seeing now is Lawrence Sigmund Bittaker born September 27th 1940 in Pittsburgh PA from birth he was disowned by his parents mm. his mother was a homemaker his father Worked in aviation mechanics for hmm. for the war effort, World War Two. Okay. The, so a little bit about the foster situation in this time, and I don't know if it's still like this today, but a parent or two parents would give their kids to foster care, but then those kids would kind of recycle back to the parents, and it's kind of a uh, a t we call it a turning door. A revolving we, door? Yeah, a revolving door. We saw in that one case, and, and you know, it's kind of... Uh, oh, it's just one of the recent ones we covered. Yeah, it kind of struck me as weird. It's like, why would they give the kids back to the parents? Well, at that time, that was how the system worked. Uh, you, you would live with the foster parent, and then you would be sent back with the parents once they're deemed you know, trustworthy or whatever. I and it would if, just be a revolving door. I wonder if that's like similar to how DSS works today. Like you, if a child gets taken out of a home uh, for whatever reason, once the parent, you know, the parent can appeal and fight for that. And, you know, that kind of sounds similar. I don't know how much about the, the foster system. I don't deal too, too much with it, but. Now I will tell you that his first offense was 12 years old. He was arrested for shoplifting. Now, one of the most important things about this guy that I want you guys to take away from this episode is the two dynamics of both killers. Bittaker is not the sexual deviant. Right. He actually gets his jollies off shoplifting and, and even violent crime, stuff like that. Roy Norris is the sexual deviant. Okay. It's complete it's a complete different dynamic. That that we're seeing here, but so, both are, but both are involved, but and I, turned on uh, by the exactly. But you'll see Roy Norris's past crimes before they met were all sexual. Mm. Bedeker's were not in the least sexual. He could care less, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. His first offense though was at 12 years old. He was arrested for shoplifting. His education was terrible, terrible grades, but a 138 IQ. Okay, which that's... we do see in a lot of killers i mean i'm not killers specifically but people with high iqs they uh they don't do well in school because they don't really see the point in and in, in all of that you know they just they're so they're too smart for it bitaker has the high iq 138 he did horrible in school but during the planning once they finally meet he's the one that's going to come up with the master plan of how all this is going to work he knows where to dump the bodies he knows how to abduct the victims he knows to get the van he comes up with the 
you, you know, the entire plan, something that Roy Norris can't do because he has a very low intelligence. Okay. So we'll see that. So it's a very different dynamic between the two killers. And in fact, it's, it's, it's almost like opposites attract with these two, you know, because you really left a wonder, like, why did they even get along in the first place? Mm. But I'm going to quickly, quickly run through his arrest records, if you will. This is Bittaker. This is Bittaker. And then we're going to do another murder. Then we're going to go back to Norris. Okay. Okay, that's how we're doing the story. Sorry if I sound a little drunk. <clears throat> 1957. Reasonable. I mean, like, I am not a little drunk. Like, I'm drunk. Like, I'm not drinking anymore. And 1957, Bittaker dropped out of high school. He was arrested, and this is when he's 17 through 19. He was arrested, multiple charges of hit and run, auto thefts, and evading arrest. So nothing to do sexually here. Sounds it, like he needs to get like retested for his driver's license. How many hit and run accidents did he have? Uh, two that I saw. Two. Wow. That's, I mean, like, and, that's and, pretty bad. And Grand Theft Auto. In oh. fact, yeah. So in fact, in 1957, he was arrested by the FBI, oh. which is something you don't want. I mean, it took me years to get that off my arrest record. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm going to run through this. Bittaker was born September 27th, 1940, adopted and straight disowned by his parents. Mm. 12 years old, arrested for shoplifting. As I said, 1957, arrested by the FBI for Interstate Motor Vehicle Theft Act. August of 1959, when he was 19 years old, he was convicted and sent to Oklahoma Federal Reformatory for 18 months. He then transferred to the medical center in Springfield, Missouri. He was arrested again for robbery. So see, nothing sexual here. And the reason I'm saying that is because Roy Norris, his arrest record is nothing but sexual stuff. He was sentenced to serve one to 15 years. At this point, he was given a psychiatric evaluation and he was deemed to have, quote, considerable concealed hostility, hmm. end quote. That's he was, it? Like there were no other, like there was no disorders that were Yeah, diagnosed? so in 1962, he was given another evaluation for, quote, poor control and impulsive behavior, hmm. end quote. It sounds like ADHD. And he stated that, quote, this from his own mouth, quote, stealing makes me feel important, end quote. 1963, he was released from prison, but he was back in prison in October of 1964 for suspicion of participating in another robbery. Another psych evaluation in 1966 gave him a, quote, borderline psychosis, End quote. He was released from prison, arrested and imprisoned for parole violations in June 1967. Five year sentence released after three years. He was in prison for burglary and parole violations. He got six months to 15 years released after three years. And then from 1974 to 1978, his first violent crime. He actually was in a supermarket, Harris Teeter, whatever, and he stuffed a Big old hunky steak down his pajamas. That people still do that. Like we, and when I was working, um, before I moved down here, there was I was at one of my stores, and like people like would like put like whole like because <laughs> we sell hands. like the, the jumbo size. No, we sell like ground beef in a long ass fucking tube, and they like put those down like all the meat down their pants. Like, what are you doing with that meat down your pants? Like, just fucking buy it. So he actually stuffed the steak down his pants and then when he walks out of the store the clerk goes up and is like hey is that a big old piece of meat in your pants and he was like yes so he pulls out a knife and stabs the guy oh okay oh. that's definitely not what i was expecting <laughs> so this is his first violent crime i hope he like got a good piece of meat and not just like fucking like <laughs> salisbury steak or some shit <laughs> wagyu <laughs> And, you know, it's kind of fucked up because he's had such an extensive record already. He was initially put in for, you know, a attempted murder because he literally stabbed the dude. Yeah. And it was downgraded to convicted with assault with a deadly weapon. So less than a few years later, he was released from prison in 1978. 
All right, so let's move on. All right, so what I want you to know about Lawrence Bittaker is that he prefers the theft to anything. He's not the, like I said earlier, he's not the deviant. He loves stealing. He's also violent. He's the violent one of the bunch. And he's also a machinist. And at the time, you know, a machinist, they uh, do metal work, stuff like that, like mm-hmm. uh, Patrick Bateman. Like or, work um, on machines. What's his name? Patrick Bateman. Patrick Bateman's American Psycho. Right. Yeah, no, but the guy that was in The Machinist. Christian Bale. Christian Bale. So oh, he was that a, was a good movie. He was a machine guy. And at the time, he was making $1,000 a week. It's Pretty like, good. dude, that's good money. That's good. And this is 1978. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's so, more yeah. than I make today. $1,000 yeah, so like, a week. <laughs> but during the time, you know, it was a skill that not everyone had. Mm-hmm. So they paid for it, especially during the war. Well, this was post-war effort, but... I mean, dude, you're making four grand a month and you're just going to throw it all away. I know it's not a ton. I mean, it is a ton, but. All right, guys, we're going to pause the episode here tonight and we'll see you next time for part two to be released on Thursday.